What is going on, neighborhood? It's so good to be with you today. Do me a favor, right off the right off the jump here. Go ahead and grab your Bible and let's get right into the Word of God, all right? John chapter 6 is where we're at for today. It's where we've been for the past few weeks. And so I hope uh, uh, you are enjoying the text as much as I am. Uh, we are now at verse number 30. And so John chapter 6, verse number 30. And when you are there, just tell your neighbor, hey, I'm already here. Where are you at? Tell him to hurry up. Tell her to hurry up. <laughs> Anyways, <clears throat> starting in verse number 30, here is what the Bible says. It says, so they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Somebody say amen to God's word. <clears throat> Before we move forward, let's make sure that we pray, and uh, let's welcome the Holy Spirit in our space here to be able to communicate with us and lead us into a greater understanding of Jesus. All right, bow your heads. Father, we love you so much, and we are so thankful, God, for your word. Holy Spirit, I pray, God, that you would illuminate the scriptures to us today, that you would open up our understanding, Father, that as a result of today, that we would grow closer and closer to you, that our perspective of Jesus would be that much more bigger. We thank you, God, for all that you do in our lives. Have your way right here, right now. We love you. We honor you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in case you're just catching up on what we're learning and growing in as a church, we've been spending a lot of time in John chapter 6, where initially we see Jesus feed 5,000 uh, men with five fish and two loaves. Then almost as if um, that was just an illustration to a much deeper opportunity for understanding, Jesus begins to lead the crowd out of uh, simply wanting stuff uh, or more bread from him by teaching them the true nature of God and who is actually standing right there in front of them. So they asked Jesus this question. They said, you know, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? It's almost like, what's your trick? You know, what, what do you do, basically? Um, what work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so I guess, you know, they were probably saying like, it looks like you can do the, the bread trick. So what else can you do? Um, <laughs> you know, they kept looking for more things to happen in the natural. Have you ever wondered why we can get so hyper-focused on our natural needs? It's almost as if our natural desires, you know, take precedence over our spiritual needs. Before you sit there and go, you know, no, nah, that's not me. No, no, don't act like it isn't you. I'll be honest with yourself. We all have a tendency to desire more stuff from time to time, to desire more bread, so to speak, you know. Yet our understanding of God, our prioritization of Jesus, becomes marginalized. Listen to me. God is so much bigger than you think. Or maybe I can say it this way. God is so much bigger than you think you know. Because all of us have some baseline knowledge, even as a Christian. 
In fact, to me, as a follower of Jesus for quite some time now, I don't sit there and I don't sit, dwell on what I think I have. Oh yeah, I got this. I understand this. Oh yeah, I've read this passage before. I don't do things like that. Because when I do things like that, I close off myself to the opportunity of God doing something new in my life. Somebody say amen. And so here's my, my challenge to you. Don't get closed off. You know, don't, well, I've see, read that verse thousands of times. I memorize it. There's scriptures that I have memorized that God is still showing me cool things in. God is still showing me um, uh, uh, treasures in. And so don't close yourself to the opportunity of God. That is a form of pride. And so let's humble ourselves as we approach the scriptures, okay? Because for me personally, it's scriptures like this, like what we read today, that remind me of just how big God really is. So, Look at Jesus' response to their questions, to their uh, um, <laughs> um, inquisitive nature, so to speak. Uh, first thing he does is he corrects their perspective because their perspective was way off. They viewed Moses as someone who gave them bread in the wilderness. And so right off the bat, they were looking in the natural to source the impossible. And so their idea of the bread that came, came down from heaven, the manna in the wilderness that happened during the time of Moses with the children of Israel, from their slant, they, they, they saw and they thought that Moses was the one that provided for them. Even though I know that they, they knew God rained it down from heaven, but for whatever reason, they magnified Moses to be, to be almost on par on, and equal with God. You know, if you think about it this way, bread from heaven has to come from heaven. And so from that standpoint, Moses couldn't do that. It would have to be God. And then we look here and we see in verse number 32 that Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. It wasn't Moses. It wasn't anything in the natural. It wasn't anything or anyone from this world could do. Jesus was saying, this was my father's doing. The Bible says that with God, nothing is impossible. So in other words, the impossible is always associated with God. Raining bread from heaven, that's impossible, which means that Moses couldn't do that. It had to be God. So let's just make sure that we as a people, let's make sure that uh, to not attribute our experience of something miraculous to coincidence. Let's just make sure that we always give God the glory in everything. Somebody say amen if you believe that. So look at what Jesus teaches them. He says, my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. True bread comes from the Father. True bread comes from heaven. And that bread is not a commodity. It's not a seed. It's not a grain. It's not wheat. It's not barley. It is a he. It is a person. The bread of God is a person. Isn't it interesting that we, well, when we have issues in life, when things uh, go astray or awry for us, we always look for a thing or a what? I need more money. I need a job. I need a new job. Instead of seeking the bread of God, he who came down from heaven, he who gives life to the whole world. That's who we need to seek in moments like this. They responded and they said, sir, give us this bread always. And hear me on this. This is one of the greatest theological statements, I think, in all of the Bible. Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Two things to note about how Jesus identifies himself. And these things ought to cause us to look at Jesus with that much more uh, depth, to, to look at him with that much more intention, and understand the true nature of of God. And, and the first thing that I want us to look at is that Jesus said, I am. Jesus is I am. You have to understand that when Moses saw a burning bush in the wilderness, when he first spoke to God, God told him, God told Moses that his name was I am. Now, you don't have to go there, but in Exodus chapter 3, verse 13, here's what the Bible says. It says that then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, 
the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they asked me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Somebody say amen to that. First thing that we can glean off of this I am that Jesus says is number one, it is the name of God. The Hebrew translation of I am is where we get the name Yahweh, where God gets his name. I'm not going to try to butcher the Hebrew <laughs> um, uh, uh, words for it, but it can be translated as I am who I am, I will be who I will be, and I will be who I was. In other words, we serve a God that has no limits. He is who he is, he is who he is going to be, and he is who he was. That's an amazing thing. He has zero limits. There's nothing that about Jesus, about God, where we can sit there and go, oh, that's not something that he can do. No, 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 no. His very name encompasses everything. And so uh, that's something to note, and that's something to, to, to ponder as you and I worship this Jesus, as you and I worship God. Second thing about I am is that his name speaks of his nature. His name is not limited to any specific characteristic. Now in Genesis, you know, they named him by his characteristics. He was Jehovah Jireh. Why? Because he was able to provide. He was the provider. He was Jehovah Rapha. Why? Because he is the God who heals. He is just Jehovah Sidkenu. He is the Lord my righteousness. These are all uh, attributes or characteristics that bear witness of God's nature. But in the name Yahweh, he is not limited to any specific characteristic. I am encompasses all of those things. Whatever they called him and however they named him because of the mighty feats that God has done in the Old Testament, Yahweh encompasses all of them. Nothing limits Yahweh and his name describes his nature. Third thing to note about the I am is that in understanding I am, the character of God does not change. He's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God that, that we saw in the Old Testament that is now with skin on right here in John chapter 6, standing right in front of him. In fact, in the book of John, John gives us seven, um, you know, technically eight I am statements that speak of his nature. But in this moment, as he was speaking to the crowd by saying, I am, it became a callback to what Exodus 3.15 says about who he is. He said that he is the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That same God that was with your forefathers is the same God that stands here before you today. And the character of that God that you knew the God that parted the Red Sea, the God that, is, that, that has done all those miraculous things of old. After 400 years of silence, now the Messiah stands before you. And the character of the God that you previously once knew is the, character, the same character of the God that stands before you now. The God that made a covenant to Abraham. The God that kept the covenant through Isaac. The God that, that gave the descendants of Jacob the promised land and renamed them Israel. He's the same God that stands before you to, to give bread that you may have eternal life. The I am was now standing there in front of them. And I don't know about you, understanding what we know today about the scripture, man, that moment had to have been mind-blowing, at least for us from this side and being able to read about it, it's mind-blowing to me. That, the, that everything that they knew about God is now standing right there in front of them. What's crazy is that they had no clue. The second thing to note about how Jesus responded to the crowd was that he declared himself to be the true bread from heaven. As the crowd brought up this 
parallel of manna, the bread from heaven given to the people of Israel in the wilderness, the one that they try to give credit to, uh, to Moses for. Jesus was in essence saying, by saying, I am the bread of life, I am the true bread from heaven, he's basically saying, I am the manna. Now to understand manna, you have to go all the way back to Exodus uh, chapter number 16. And this is what it says in verse four. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. Now, Jesus is the true bread came from heaven. So what in essence was described in Exodus is how we have to look at Jesus today. One, it came from heaven. The source is heaven. In other words, there's no better source for this bread. No matter what this world has to offer, no matter what um, you see that looks appealing on this planet, in the natural. I don't know about you, but I'd, I want heaven's bread. Whatever this looks like here, there's nothing that compares to heaven's bread. There's nothing that compares to Jesus. You know, um, Paul would put it this way, all these things I count as rubbish. Everything else might as well be garbage compared to knowing Jesus is what he said. That, in essence, was the manna. That's who Jesus was describing as himself to be, that he came down from heaven. Here's another thing that we can draw from manna, is that it would only last for a day. Manna was given six days a week. It, it, you could only gather a day's uh, portion at a time, except for on Friday. Uh, the, the Friday portion was double um, just to prepare you for Sabbath so that on the Sabbath day, you don't have to gather anything. You can just chill and you had enough. What's interesting about the manna is that when you gather it day by day, after that day, it expired, it rotted. You can't like store manna for weeks and have all these jars on jars. They spoil, it goes bad, it's nasty. Or so I heard. <laughs> Anyways, so if you think about that, God wanted the children of Israel to rest in his work. He would make the way for them to inherit the promised land. Remember, this is all happening in the middle of a wilderness where there was seemingly no food. So much so that their hunger caused them to desire to go back into bondage because at least they got food over there is how they thought. Now, here's the thing about the manna is that it taught them to trust for God's provision every single day. And you and I have to work on that. This is what we have to glean from who Jesus is as manna. I need to be able to trust the Lord day in and day out. Not yesterday's trust, because yesterday's trust, you know, that was for yesterday. I have a new set of trust for today, because there's a new set of, of, of life happening today. There's a new set of possible issues or blessings that are happening day in and day out. And every single day, to me, I have to trust God for his provision every day. And you want to have to do that. You have to learn that. You have to be able to trust God for his provision every single day. Somebody say amen to that. Now, if you think about this, on Fridays when they had to go gather a double portion, as they gathered, could you see their faith possibly waver on Fridays going, oh man, I hope we gathered enough because there's not going to be any manna tomorrow. You know, is it going to be enough for Saturday? Or are we going to be hungry for that day? Are we, <laughs> are we going to be fasting on Saturday inadvertently because there's not enough manna? Here's the neat thing, is that for 40 years, they relied on receiving manna from heaven, bread from ha heaven, to be able to, uh, to satisfy their hunger. God was there for 40 years in the wilderness, providing for them. And as they were doing that, in essence, they were getting the, the old thinking out of them. They are now beginning to rely on God. Listen to me, follower of Jesus. You have to now begin to learn how to cultivate this reliance on Jesus, not just for Sunday's work, not just for one day a week. You have to learn how to um, cultivate this trust in him that he's going to provide for you day in and day out for things that are major as well as for things that are minuscule. This is what Jesus um, is for us. He's someone that is very trustworthy, but you have to be able to give the trust to him. Surrender all that you think that you're able to do on your own and trust him. 
Could I do things out of my own accord, out of my own strength that uh, don't necessarily require faith? Of course. But for me, I want, I want the prize that God offers. I want, I want Jesus' prize. I want, I want to be able to pursue the upward call, the prize of Jesus. I, want to, I don't want to look back on yesterday's manna. I want to be able to reach for today's manna, for today's treasure, and, and what lays ahead. In order for me to do that, I have to cultivate this trust in God every single day. What did Jesus teach us to pray? He said, give us our daily bread. Give us our daily provision. In other words, let us rely on God to provide. It doesn't, doesn't immune you from working. No, if he may have provided you a job, so then work it to the glory of God. But in all things spiritual, in all things where you feel like your feelings are, are overwhelming you, your emotions are overwhelming you, surrender those things to God and begin to trust him to be able to provide peace for you, to be able to, uh, to, be able to unhand you from any form of, of anxiety. That Remember, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and that is the God that you and I serve. Somebody say amen. Once you're able to, to formulate that form of a lifestyle and function that way, it is blessed. And uh, uh, let me be the first to say, I told you so. <laughs> no, um, just trust me on that. It's good. It's gooder than good. Somebody say amen. Third thing that we, uh, we ought to uh, glean from this uh, uh, manna is that manna was given at a time while the children of Israel were being purified in the wilderness before they could inherit the promise of God. So before they can enter into the promised land, God provided for them. They had to learn during this time. In other words, God was renewing their mind about who he was. He, they saw, before they entered into the promised land, they saw the mighty hand of God free them from bondage in Egypt. They saw the Red Sea part. They were able to get water in the desert, in the wilderness, from the craziest sources and when their their bellies were hungry because they lacked food god rained it down from heaven and so as we see the manna come from heaven jesus is now given by the father and you are not you and i are in the same boat as these children of israel were we are now made righteous in him before you and i can inherit heaven in other words we are being sanctified in jesus every single day. So here's the significance of bread and manna. Just to sum it all up, Jesus is the bread from heaven. He is the true bread from heaven. He's the true bread of life. Second thing is that Jesus is the gift of satisfaction in a dry, barren wasteland. When, when things were going awry for uh, the children of Israel and they had nothing uh, to be able to eat, God provided for them. In essence, the same thing for us. This world, this life can be barren. This life can be a spiritual wasteland. But Jesus is the gift of satisfaction in that dry, barren wasteland. And the third thing is that Jesus is necessary for eternal satisfaction. Hear me on this. Jesus is not optional. And you have to remember this. You have to look at this and go, wait a minute. How am I living my life? I know that Jesus is not optional, but sometimes my life lives different. I don't know about you, but when I see Jesus this way, it makes every issue that I've ever had in my life small in comparison to knowing him more. Once again, look at verse 35. It says that I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. There's a bunch of nevers in that verse that if you would just come to him, if you would just believe in him, we will never hunger. We will never thirst. This is not a physical satisfaction. This is a spiritual satisfaction that doesn't just last for a moment or a meal. It lasts for eternity. So here's my question to you, my friend. How will you respond knowing that this is the God that you and I serve? How should your life look different based on you knowing that the true bread, the bread that I need to be hungering for, is not a commodity, it's not a, a thing, it's not wheat, it's not grain. It's a person, it's a he, it's Jesus. How will you respond? What, how will your life look different knowing what you've read about today? 
Because to me, the more and more that the Holy Spirit reveals Jesus to me, the more and more my life ought to change. I don't do the changing, but what I do is I respond to the Holy Spirit and then I endeavor to walk out all that he has shown before me. Something to think about for sure. Anyways, let's stop right there and we'll pick up um, next week. All right, do me a favor, bow your heads right where you're at. Let me pray for you before you go. Don't, don't you dare push stop right now. Let me, let me pray for you, all right? We can use all the prayers. Can I, can I get an amen? So, bow your heads. Father, I thank you for this moment. I thank you, God, that you have given us the true bread of life, God, the true bread that has come from heaven, Lord, in your son, Jesus. I thank you, Father, for the magnitude of who you are, God, and Jesus personified that as he declared himself the I am. I thank you, God, that, that you've, know, you, you've deemed us to understand that Jesus is the bread of life. He is the ultimate satisfaction, Lord, that we can receive on this side of eternity. And I thank you, God, for your promise that if we would simply just come to you and believe in you, we will never lack. Father, I pray, God, for those that are hearing my voice right now that have not yet come to you and that do not believe in you. I pray, God, that you would draw them to you. I pray, God, that they would receive the free gift of grace, God, and find salvation in Jesus. We thank you, God, for today. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining me today, friend. I look forward to seeing you next week.